Thank you very much, Graham. I'll get my slides up here and then we'll get going. I'm assuming you see my title slide now. Yeah. All right, very good. Uh, thank you again, Graham. Uh, as Graham said, I'm, I run a, a new organization called the Open Hardware Group. Uh, depending on your involvement with RISC V, and I'll take a quick uh, show of hands survey here in a moment. Um, you might you might know me or remember me from the RISC V Foundation. I was the founder, founding executive director of the of the RISC V Foundation uh, over some five years ago. So it's uh, it's been a, a fun ride indeed. Uh, but before I, I begin. Uh, Graham, if you could be my eyes for me and just let me know what you see. First question for the audience is, before you registered for this event, and there was, in fact, you know, Risk Five meetup in the title, how many in the room had heard of Risk Five before? Show of hands, please. I think almost everywhere, Rick. And you've actually got Jeremy on this end rather than Graham. But um, uh, I'm sorry, Jeremy. I, I'm sorry uh, about that. Uh, Graham, uh, I knew I that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that was uh, almost one. Okay, 100%. That's good because the, the questions get harder from here. Uh, how many of you keep your hands up and uh, leave your hand up if you've actually downloaded the specs for the RISC V ISA? Um, 40%. 40%. Okay, those of you that have downloaded them, how many of you have read them? Mm, uh, one or two hands went down. Okay, very good. The, the, the remaining hands, how many of you ha currently have an active RISC-V project or have been involved in one? Oh, that's almost as many. Awesome, good. 30% so, at least. Very good, thank you. Th thanks, Jeremy. So for those of you that had your hands up, my, my intro slides that are coming up here uh, for, for my talk, I'm going to give a brief intro of the RISC V ISA, why we care, why we should care, and where it came from. Um, and uh, some of you may be able to give this just as well as I can, if uh, given how many people were involved in uh, in projects in the room. And then I'll talk about a, a new organization called the Open Hardware Group and some open source cores within that group, uh, namely the RISCI core, a 32-bit core and the Ariane core, a 64-bit core, both of which originated from the good, good folks at ETH Zurich in Switzerland. And that'll be, that'll be the, the breadth of my talk. So why do we care about ISAs anyway? Uh, well, when you think about it, you know, 99% of the laptops volume-wise um, and, and, and you know, compute platforms that we use today are, are based on x86 and what's interesting is the x86 64-bit ISA is, is not even developed by Intel it's from AMD um, and a uh, lion's share of the volume is owned by Intel and then conversely on you know, mobile devices and tablets it's all ARM based and, and Intel's been certainly investing for years until they again stopped just recently through some divestitures uh, in trying to penetrate the mobile market to no avail. And ARM has done a lot of work together with the ecosystem to penetrate the server market and some inroads are beginning, but it's been a long, hard battle. And how on earth does IBM still sell mainframes? I mean, my goodness. Uh, the, the simple fact of the matter is the ISA is the most important interface in a computer system. It's where software meets hardware. And that's how you twiddle the bits, so to speak. If that's true, then why why do we not have any open standards for an ISA? Pretty much every other interface in a computing system has plenty of successful open standards to govern that piece of technology. And why not in the ISA space? I'll just leave that question hanging. If you, if you take a, a dive or a look into a modern SOC, and I've got an NVIDIA Tegra SOC shown here as an example, but any modern SOC has very much the same sort of characteristics in that there are many, many ISAs on the, on the SOC. 
across applications, graphics, image processors, radio and audio DSPs, uh, some housekeeping processors for power management, some, some crypto or security processors, some of which are developed in-house as proprietary, just because they're, they're relatively small controllers, some of which are licensed, some of which have secret sauce from the SOC vendor. So they, they all have this variety of, of ISAs. And if you're in the software space, then you know that they all have their own support stack, a unique support stack and tool chain associated with it. And if, if we were starting a brand new company and went into our, our new boss uh, and said, hey, guess what? We're going we're gonna to develop an SOC for you here, boss. And we're probably going to have upwards of you know, half a dozen to a dozen of unique and distinct ISAs on this system. And oh, yeah, they'll all have different tool chains that we'll need to support we'd probably get fired, right? It's, not an, it's, it's, it's certainly not an elegant engineering approach to solving this problem. Do we, do we really need all these different ones? And if we do, do they have to be proprietary? Um, and what, you know, what if there was a, a one that was free and open that everyone could use for everything across all computing devices? Well, of course, you know, we, we believe that there is, and I think the ecosystem at large would suggest that, you know, this is a, this is a, a true, it's not just our belief, it's something that's quite true. So from, from a background standpoint, this came out of the lab at UC Berkeley uh, back in, in, in 2010, actually, is when the project started where after many years of research using all kinds of different architectures, the team was looking at, what they wish, what they should do for their sort of next generation of you know pedagogical tools and, and labs, and in the summer of 2010 they started a three-month project to develop their own clean slate ISA because they'd done it before, uh, way back in the early 80s, under uh, Patterson's original work, uh, and that three-month project, some four years later, <laughs> turned into in the May of 2014, a a released uh, base user spec, frozen base user spec. Um, for the ISA. Several tape outs and research publications along the way. And uh, the, the name RISC V. So if you've ever, if you've been tempted to call it RISC V, please don't. It's RISC V, as in the fifth generation of RISC design, uh, ISA design and research at Berkeley, the RISC I dating back to the early 80s under Dave Patterson's work. And there was a RISC II kind of lost the naming recipe for SOAR and SPUR, which uh, we now sort of re affectionately refer to as RISC three and four. Uh, but this is the fifth generation of, of risk architecture research at UC Berkeley, hence the name RISC V. And then probably around, I guess it was really the summer of 2014, it became obvious that there was a fair amount of industry take up and interest in what was being done because every time the research team published something, where they changed something in the ISA, they were getting a fair amount of feedback or uh, input, we'll call it, that, hey, guys, that was really good what you did over there. Don't change it. I'm relying on it. And, you know, this can't be, you can't just keep changing these things. So it became clear, um, like I said, around mid-2014 to the team at Berkeley that this needed to exist outside of the four walls at Berkeley. It couldn't just be a university project any longer. And after getting ourselves organized and so on, we incorporated um, and created the nonprofit Risk Five Foundation in August of 2015 to govern the ISA. And as I, as I said at the outset, uh, I was the original executive director that started the foundation together with uh, Kirsta Sanovich and Dave Patterson and, uh, and a host of others. So what's what's so different and unique about it? Well, it's, it's it's a pretty simple ISA. It's far smaller than commercial ISAs. And when you you know when you think about it, with three decades of hindsight, uh, effectively, you know you should be able to do a better job. Um, and one of the things that's interesting is there's a very clear separation between user and privilege modes, as well as avoiding any microarchitecture dependencies. Um, in the ISA. So there's nothing built into the specification of the ISA itself that presupposes a particular implementation, um, which, is, which is good. Um, and the modularity and extensibility are probably the two most unique things about the ISA. 
So instead of one great big contiguous spec, if you will, with all of the instructions that you could possibly imagine, and that's the spec, it's made up of small, uh, small standard-based ISA and a bunch of extensions. And there's standard extensions as well as user-defined extensions. So this uh, extensibility specialization, there's a section of the opcode space that's reserved for user-defined instructions where you can add your secret sauce. And that will be, if you will, your own custom extension uh, that fits in alongside the standard extensions, which we'll talk about in a second. And as a result of this extension-based approach, once an extension is locked and loaded, it's frozen, won't change, nothing will happen to it. Your hardware and your system can rely on what's in that extension forever and ever, even if there's something wrong with it. The way that, that, you know, that would get corrected, if you will, or improved upon is through a new extension not a version of an old extension. So that extension will remain in place, warts and all, if there are some, um, and that behavior then can be uh, counted on in terms of the, your, your system. Only then if you added new extensions through new feature upgrades to that product, would you, you know, be, be a, uh, correcting that unintended functionality, if you will. So that, that stability aspect's pretty important as, as well. So as I said, the, the ISA itself is, a, is built upon a base ISA plus standard extensions. And there are four base uh, integer uh, ISAs, 32, 64, and 128-bit integer, and then a 32-bit uh, compressed. And it's, it's pretty small, less than 50 instruction, hardware instructions for the base, uh, 32i. And then the, Bunch of standard extensions, and there's and there's more being developed by the foundation. And these are just some examples. Um, uh, and and there's this notion of the G classification of an extension, which is really a general purpose ISA that includes a concatenation, if you will, of the IMAFD extensions. And we'll we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. And all of these ex, uh, extensions have a fairly standard risk encoding and a fixed 32-bit uh, instruction format. And uh, as I said, uh, the, the, uh, I, the ISA and the various components uh, are supported ever after once they're released. And the base ISA spec, uh, as I mentioned earlier, was re released back in 2014 and subsequently has been ratified by the, uh, by the technical committee uh, in the RISC-V Foundation. So all this is goodness. So for those of you that have, uh, I can't see the audience, but if you're like me and have, uh, are of a vintage where gray hair is rampant, um, you might remember a thing called a green card from some of the old mainframes that you got to work on. And to illustrate how simple the RISC-V ISA is, I'm gonna build out the RISC-V green card. So these are the, uh, this is the 32i that I mentioned that has like the fit less than 50 instructions. Now we'll add 14 more for privilege. And then we'll add another eight for the multiply divide extension, another 11 for atomics. And then the floating point, uh, um, floating point double and quad. And another 46 for the compressed mode. And then add in for the 64i and 128i uh, uh, variants to each of those categories. And that builds out your green card, which is, is pretty cool. I mean, you don't have to have a, 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 you know, a magnifying glass to read it. It actually fits on a fold out uh, sheet in textbooks. And in fact, um, Patterson and the, the uh, Traditional Patterson and Hennessy textbook is now RISC-V based, um, computer architecture and design. And uh, there is a tear out of a RISC-V green card in that textbook. Okay, so that's that's all well and good, right? The, uh, an open, a free and open ISA seems like it's a really good idea and it is. And what we're doing with that is creating this new frontier of processor design and innovation that really was unprecedented. So Jeremy and I, uh, you know, could start a processor company in his kitchen tomorrow. And we wouldn't need to ask anybody, we wouldn't need to sign a, a, a you know, a whole lot of legal documents to get a, a license, architectural or otherwise, or pay lots of money or anything like that. We're just away we go, we download the specs, we apply our, our knowledge to how we 
uh, how well we can design processors or accelerators and we're off to the races. And that's, that's good. There are plenty of both for-profit, you know, proprietary commercial designs. There's also plenty of open source processor implementations that are emerging, just like there was in the very early days of Linux. Uh, um, there were far more distributions than there are today that started to emerge around uh, the Linux OS. And one of the things that we need to ask ourselves as an industry is how many open source implementations do we need? It's great from a pedagogical standpoint that you know Jeremy and I could do our do our thing, and if we were you know in a university setting, we could stand up our open source implementation, and people could use it from a from a teaching tool standpoint, and that's good. But how many is too many for widespread industry adoption? How, if you think of the pool of resources across the globe that will work on open source projects? the more open source implementations of relatively speaking or effectively the same thing, all that we're doing is dividing up those available open source resources across the industry into smaller and smaller pieces of the pie. So how do we organize to establish critical mass around a handful of open source cores that can benefit all? That's, that's part of the that's part of the challenge I think that we have as an industry and that's part of what we're trying to address uh, with this organization called the Open Hardware Group and in particular the core five family of cores. Uh, so as, as I was um, you know, making the transition out of my executive director role in the RISC-V Foundation, I was approached by uh, some key players in the RISC-V ecosystem who had uh, developed a fair amount of affection, if you will, for the open source cores that uh, originated out of the, uh, the university at ETH Zurich in Switzerland, namely the RISC-E core and Ariane, and Alex will talk to you about IBEX uh, soon. Um, I was approached um, by some key industry members to create a new nonprofit organization and you might say, well, why is this not part of the RISC-V Foundation? And the bylaws and governance framework for the RISC-V Foundation itself is for the ISA uh, and uniquely the ISA. So the specification stack associated with defining what the ISA is and how it works, not for implementations. The RISC-V Foundation is chartered with loving all implementations, be they proprietary, commercial, open, closed, or otherwise. Um, as opposed to any particular implementation. Um, so I was asked to stand up an organization that could uh, be a host for open processor cores, and in particular, just the open processor cores um, and closely related IP around those cores, supported and implemented using standard commercial tools that fit into existing SOT, SOC tool flow at, at some of the larger semiconductor and uh, you know, ASIC, ASSP companies, be they system companies or, or pure play chip companies, leveraging those commercial tools um, and for use uh, in high volume production SOCs. So a high degree of IP verification and validation, as well as uh, effective manufacturability so that again, they can be used in, in high volume production SOCs. So I'm going to talk to you now about uh, the Open Harbor Group a little bit, and then the, the Core Five cores. So we've got some pretty good traction uh, within the Open Hardware Group uh, initial group of sponsors. Um, Jeremy and his team at Embacosm are, uh, are are sponsors of this activity, so, and we thank you for that, as well as as well as many other logos and companies that you probably recognize. Um, and you know, this group of companies, we brought them to the table or asked them anybody's invited to help us get this organization uh, up and running and effective. But we wanted a cross section of companies who were big chip guys, smaller IP guys, tool guys, systems guys, small, small companies, large companies, uh, verification companies, um, so that we could have a, a, a cross section of uh, sponsors that we believe will represent the full of the membership as we are, we are fully operational. And what's the purpose of the organization? Fundamentally, it's maintaining um, 
and developing a specific roadmap of open source processor cores and related hardware and software ecosystem. And then as well as um, promoting and licensing the trade, trademarks and certification marks for how that open source IP will be used. Um, and that's fundamentally it, right? We're, we're not trying to create a new tool chain for the chip industry to use. We're not trying to create new SOC flows or, or solve an entire SOC problem. We're really working on a pretty narrow focus of processor IP um, and closely related processor IP. By that, I mean memory subsystems, you know, PICs, uh, uh, and, and so on. But not the not the the uncore, if you will, of the SOC. And as a starting point, um, we are dealing with uh, the, one of the one of the sponsors is uh, ETH Zurich, as you saw in that slide earlier, and in particular the Pulp team, the Parallel Ultra Low Power Research Team, uh, you know, under the banner of the Pulp platform, where uh, the Risky Core. Uh, and Ariane cores came from, and uh, Alex will talk in a minute about Zero Risky, which um, Low Risk is, has rebranded re Ibex in the same way that we'll rebrand these cores under the Core 5 family. Um, and in particular, we'll, we will become the official committer of these repositories for this 32 bit four stage uh, uh, core, the Risky core, and the 64 bit six stage Ariane core. And as we do that, the ETH Zurich team transitions into, as any, any other interested party would be, um, a contributor role um, as, as the Open Hardware Group takes over official committer responsibilities. So this is very exciting. And next few slides here are a little bit of detail on these cores if you haven't seen them before. Uh, this risky four-stage RV32 I am FC, and if you remember from the standard uh, nomenclature that I showed you earlier, those are uh, particular uh, extensions um, in the in the RISC V ISA. And then the X pulp on the end includes some custom extensions that the pulp team defined, and uh, that is shown in the slide here under the various extensions for uh, a P EPAC SIMD, some, some bit manipulations and hardware loops. And some of those will um, be maintained as is, and then other variants will be created to uh, track the evolution of the ISA standard as uh, particular extensions emerge to cover that functionality. Some of the reason for the, the custom extensions in, these, in this device in particular was, it was it's been out for a while, uh, as, as you can see in the uh, bullet towards the end, it's been silicon proven in a bunch of different nodes. Um, there's probably been, uh, I'd say more than a dozen tape outs, both inside the university and outside. And I'll talk about a few more, uh, on some of the outside ones in a few minutes, but it's, a, it's this is um, referred to as the workhorse, if you will, of the Pulp platform team. And it's, it's been uh, a very, very well received uh, device. In the interest of time, I won't walk you through the block diagram, but you guys will have these slides later if you want them. So some of the commercial use are outside of the university. An organization called Green Waves, a very impressive company in Grenoble, has a product called the Gap 8. This actually has nine RISC-V cores in it, RISC-E cores in it, Core 5 RISC-E cores. One as a control processor, and then an octal set of accelerators uh, doing basically IoT edge uh, processing for uh, for AI and ML. Uh, and there's a very very cool uh, drone video with their uh, with their device on it of a drone flying around in in one of the buildings at ETH Zurich actually. Uh, that's that's worth looking up if you uh, if you haven't seen this before. It's a cool device. So this is in production and available now. Another interesting um, platform is uh, a platform called the Vega Board uh, that was released by the team at NXP under uh, uh, an open organization called openisa.org. 
And this device has two ARM cores on it and two um, RISC V cores, one being the zero RISC-E that I mentioned earlier that Alex will talk about, and then the other being the, the RISC-E core uh, that's, that I'm uh, describing here. Uh, and this is a very cool project. And the NXP team you know, looked uh, at, at the work that the Zurich folks had done and said, hey, you know what, this is pretty good. Um, the PPA analysis that they did and overall evaluation of the TH Zurich team's work was, hey, uh, this is pretty close to, if not as good as what we'd have done on our own. Uh, so let's figure out what we need to do in order to adopt these kinds of open source IP blocks and high volume production SOCs. And so part of that work led to this research and development project, really. It's not a, it's not a product per se, but um, they are spreading these boards around the world in, uh, in rather rapid fashion. And it's, it's been a pretty, uh, pretty significant success. So that's it for the uh, RISC-E core, the 32-bit device. Uh, there's a 64-bit six-stage GC core. So if you remember, the G was the general purpose device, IMAFD support. And this is a Linux capable six stage in order single issue um, processor uh, that's optimized for performance um, at one and a half gig and a 22 nanometer FDX process from, from uh, uh, Global Foundries. Uh, it's, a, it's quite a, a cool product, uh, our core. Um, again, I'll flip over the block diagram and just talk about some of the implementations. So, so far there's been two tape outs um, inside uh, ETH in, as I said, 22 nanometer FDX uh, in devices called Poseidon and Cosmodrom. Um, they're, they're, they're both cool devices are up and running in the lab. And in fact, Cosmodrom has two different versions, a high performance and lower performance version of the Ariane core. And if you've seen any of the presentations about area and they're also doing, uh, they also have a collaboration with the University of Princeton on a platform called the Open Python with uh, um, a number of accelerators and, and, and cores based on the Python or, or um, architecture that is controlled by an Ariane core. Okay, so where, where are we? This is, uh, Last couple of slides here. So the, where we are as an organization is we've we've legally re registered a, an, an open source not-for-profit corporation. We launched the organization just before the Zurich week workshop a little over a month ago, and then presented at the uh, RISC V workshop that was hosted on campus at ETH Zurich in, in mid-June. Um, you can see what we've got up on our site in terms of testimonials and folks who think this is a good idea amongst our sponsors and partners. And we're, we're actively working uh, on locking down the governance, uh, bylaws, IP rules, contribution rules, and so on um, for the open hardware group. And uh, we are accepting sponsors who are, you know, are passionate about this, who want to participate in that work to join us and, and help us. Um, you know, drive, put your hands on the steering wheel, if you will, and drive how this organization takes shape. And that's it for me. You know, we're, we're focused on supporting uh, these open cores, um, which have, a, a, you know, a quite, quite a bit of enthusiastic support across the industry and academia. And it'll be a full, think about this as, you know, if you were getting processor IP from your favorite processor IP vendor, the kinds of things that you would expect to get uh, in support of that IP is what we are um, establishing to produce in the open hardware group. And that's going to be contributed by all of the member organizations that are participating. Um, and um, with, you know, fully validated tool flows and, and proven uh, PPA characteristics, good support, tool chains for OS, Sartos, and, and so on, as well as having a, a strong footprint. One of the things that we are, will be establishing for the open hardware group is this, this nonprofit is incorporated in Canada. 
sorry if you couldn't understand my Canadian accent through the course of my presentation. I apologize for that, as a good Canadian should. Um, and we'll also have a subsidiary in in Zurich, uh, you know, adjacent to and part of ETH uh, on campus, as well as uh, a subsidiary in Shanghai, to make sure that we can support the cores internationally. And that, I think that's my last slide, Jeremy. It is. Thank you very much, Rick. Uh, so uh, Rick can take a few questions. Please wait until I pass you the microphone because then Rick can hear you and we'll get you on tape. Andy, probably introduce yourself for Rick's benefit. Hi, Rick. It's um, Andy Bennett. Um, great talk. Really enjoyed hearing about what, what you're doing. And um, my, my question is around the bit you said about having one, one free ISA rather than tons and tons of them on a SOC. And I think you make a really good case for elegance there. Um, but also, I think that how many we need is more of an economic question rather than a technical question. And we've had we've had free ones before, like like MIPS and the four at UCB, and even Spark was supposed to be open. So why is risk risk five captured the imagination where others had failed? And what kind of economic differences are there in the way that this one's being done that haven't been done before? Uh, good question, Andy. I, I, and I. I didn't plant that, but it's a perfect question. Um, there's there's a, a couple of things around it, and some folks will tell you that, oh, well, this is just so elegant. It's so well uh, architected. The ISA I'm talking about is so well architected with the extensions and so on that it's just better. So therefore, it should, it, you know, it, it it should win. It should succeed. And fundamentally, the that's true, and you know we can get into a, a technical debate as to the, the uh, pros and cons of, of any ISA. Uh, but fundamentally, if I don't have a problem, if I have an ISA today, and I don't have a problem that I, that I can't solve with my existing ISA, whether that's a technical problem or a commercial problem, then there is no need for me to look to another ISA. And the, and the reality of it is, there's there is a problem. Our industry has a significant problem. Um, I don't want to get into a physics debate, but let's just take for a given that Moore's law, in, in fact, is dead. And the the you know the fact that we've been lazy for more than a decade, 15, 20 years even, and not brought really any new architectural innovation. Again, that's a wide sweeping comment, but any significantly different architectural innovation in the processor space. We relied on doubling the performance of a processor with every, you know, every 18 months or so with the, the hop to the next geometry shrink and maintain fundamentally the same architectures and just kept stitching them together. Um, ha has made it such that there hasn't been a need for any innovation. And the reality is, that gravy train's dead, right? It's over. Um, we need to fundamentally look at purpose-built accelerators that are tuned to the data, pro data set problem that we're trying to solve and, and need appropriate tools to be able to do that. Well, it just so happens that the extensibility of an ISA like RISC V means that there's a really fertile um, toolbox, if you will, to let you configure the, uh, you know, the functionality you need and only the functionality you need into purpose-built data accelerators, uh, however you're going to cluster them, whether it's a homogeneous environment or heterogeneous environment, uh, to to handle that problem. So, if it weren't for the fact that you know there was a, you know, this sort of dead end in performance that we were looking at. You know, I don't think we'd have seen the uptake that we've seen. I mean, yes, there's people will argue that, oh, look at that, it's wonderful, it's oh, it's royalty free and there's no licenses. Okay, that's why. Well, you know, I, I learned a long time ago competing on price with anything is is not really a a sustainable competitive advantage. The the, the fact is there's an architectural problem that needs solving, and the structure and architecture of the RISC V ISA makes it easy to do. Low barrier to entry because of the commercial terms and, and legal aspects 
because it's free and open, I think is a second order impact, personally. Any more questions? Yes, Peter. Hello, uh, Peter Clayden. Um, what's Open Hardware Group's business model? Um, I, do you, is it purely from subscriptions to your members? Or, I mean, you, it sounds like you're being very philanthropic, but you have to make some money somehow. <laughs> uh, well, we certainly need enough money in order to operate. Um, and uh, it's, it's not philanthropy. Um, it's, it's literally a, a combination of, of resources brought together by members. And you don't have to be a member in order to use the open source artifacts. Uh, they are, in fact, open source. Um, free and available for anyone to use. If you want to drive, help drive the roadmap and decide on what the functionality is that goes into these cores and what the cores look like um, uh, that get put on the roadmap next and the tool chain, you know, the, the, the Verilog and system Verilog scripts, for instance, that we'll use in test benches and so on. If you want to have an influence in what that verification environment looks like, then you need to be a member in order to participate under under the uh, the membership agreement and um, those that that membership obligation carries a financial commitment as well as active contributors or full-time equivalent development uh, engineers so there's a there's a combination of cash that a member provides because they have they subscribe to and believe in an open source philosophy and and want to contribute if they if they were doing this on their own it would cost them way more. So being able to spread the pain a little bit is resonating with a bunch of these companies. Um, so the, the the model, the business model is, it is a nonprofit organization. That doesn't mean there's no revenue. That just means that any profits that uh, exist beyond the expenses of the organization get invested back into the company as opposed to uh, or into the corporation as opposed to shareholders or or any anybody else's hands for that matter. So you know the there will be resources in the open hardware group or there and there are already to help um, assemble the con the, the uh, development con con contributions from our member companies into project teams that are focused on the deliverables that we define as a as a membership. So it's a it's a community development effort, if you will. Uh, thank you very much, Rick. Um, at that point, I think we're uh, going to hand over, uh, draw a close to that. Thank you very much, Rick. I hope you're able to stay online and listen to the remaining talks. Um, and um, uh, Rick's got his contact details there. So anyone who wants to know more, who would like to join the uh, open hardware uh, group, uh, knows how to do it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rick.